This is Paul Pearson, host of Star Time. And when I'm not using my GPS to navigate the land of a thousand dances, I'm listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. You probably have questions about COVID vaccines. Here are some answers about how they're being made. How are COVID vaccines being produced faster? Usually vaccine testing and production are separate steps. But because of the pandemic, vaccines are being developed on parallel tracks. So both steps are happening just at the same time. How are the vaccines being tested? Right now, several different COVID vaccines are in testing. Each go through multiple clinical trials with up to thousands of volunteers. How do vaccines get approved? Not all COVID vaccine versions will make it to the final stages of testing and approval. Produced vaccines that do not pass clinical trials will be destroyed. But for those that do pass, a team of medical experts will examine test results and possible side effects. If the vaccine is effective and safe, it gets approved and gets to you. Go to covidvaccinewa.org to learn more. A message from the state of Washington. The Beat of the Fox with Nastiness is back on K Fox Night Beat. Yo, what's the deal? It's the legendary Hall of Fame DJ Mix Master Ice. U T F O. What's up? Who you thought this is? This is Sir Mix Like. And this is Terry Lewis. And I'm Grand Mixer GMS. What's up, y'all? This is DJ Third Degree. This is JJ Hudson from the High Children Fam. Sunday nights from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. It's K Fox Night B with DJ Nastiness. Bringing back the memories. Bringing back the memories. <laughs> Bringing Seattle's hottest music. Bringing Seattle's hottest music. Rainier Avenue Radio. Dot world. That's not Peace. This is Mondo Van Carroll for Mondo's World. We will be discussing some interesting subjects. Sometimes I might even have some guests. So please listen to my show on Rainier Avenue Radio. Atlantic Street Center has been serving the children, youth, and families of the Seattle King County area since 1910. We partner with families and communities to raise healthy, successful children and youth through services including counseling, early learning, youth development, domestic violence, and education support for school-age children. Committed to serving the African-American community, Atlantic Street Center provides services and support for all marginalized people. Learn more at AtlanticStreetCenter.org. You know you can't get enough of Rainier Avenue Radio. You're listening to Heartbeat Radio. I'm your host, Cindy Bright. Heartbeat Radio is a conversation aimed to take the pulse of corporate America. Opportunities for people of color, we're getting lost in the shuffle of change. I'm that provocateur of change. The hearts of corporate America are addressed. Access and opportunities will be accelerated for all people. Through Heartbeat Radio, you will gain a deeper understanding of what is necessary for change. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Heartbeat Radio and Podcast. I am your host, Cindy Bright. I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know we did in our family. So Hopefully you had some good time with your family, got to have some good food. Hopefully your leftovers, you've gone through all of them. I also wanted to take a minute to thank everybody uh, for who reached out to me over the last couple, three days uh, as I was just addressing some health issues and it was uh, warmed my heart to literally hear from hundreds of you over the warm wishes and the prayers for my health and I'm doing wonderful. So I thank you all for that. Tonight's show, uh, I wanted to, we have a special guest, an honorary guest. Uh, We also are scheduled to have a co-host on with me tonight. I don't know that he has sucked on with me yet. Um, But I wanted to go back to right before the holidays because it was only 10 days ago that we had another horrific um, incident, um, shooting, mass shooting in the LGBTQ community. Every week we're on talking about some of these different issues that are impacting BIPOC communities and people of color or people who are considered diverse, people who just were simply out for an evening to be amongst community and to have a good time. And so five people were killed. This is in Colorado Springs. Another 25 were injured. 
And there's quite a bit of fallout from that. And what I did is I invited the Senator elect, uh, Tony Exum, to join me tonight so that we can hear from him about what is happening in Colorado Springs. He currently serves in the House of Representatives, and so he is a seasoned le legislator, um, but re-ran to go into the Senate, and he'll be joining the Senate uh, in January. It's his district that this all occurred in. And so I wanted to welcome Senator-elect Representative Tony Exum onto Heartbeat Radio this evening. Let's bring him on. There he is. Representative Exum, how are you this evening? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Miss Cindy? I'm doing okay. I, I hate having to have this kind of a conversation tonight, but I, I certainly wanted to um, send our condolences to your community. Um, to uh, our heart goes out to all of the families impacted by all of this. Uh, and I wanted to be able to talk with you about what's happening. It looks like my co-host has signed on. So let me pause for just a second and introduce him in with us this evening as well. Uh, his name is, he's no stranger to the Seattle community. He is Deontay Damper. He is a community activist here. He is the chair of the LGBTQ for the King County NAACP. He is also the host of We Live in Color that airs right after this show on Converge Media. So let's welcome Deontay in to this conversation as well. He's got a lot. Oh, I mean, <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe, maybe, he's, maybe he's still tied up. Let's continue on with uh, Senator Exum. I apologize for that. Senator, let's hear from you what's going on in Colorado Springs. What is the mood 10 days after? Um, the shootings, how are people doing? How are you doing? Um, let's hear what's going on there. Well, well, thanks for inviting me on to, uh, to your program. Uh, I think it, it can be best described by um, a continued uh, uh, a continued shock of uh, events that continue to happen uh, not only across our country, uh, but um, it has become, when incidents happen on a frequent basis like this, I think the uh, uh, people become uh, numb uh, to, uh, to what's happening. And uh, uh, it's, just, uh, it's just sad that uh, these things continue to happen. And then there's always that conversation uh, it seems to be consistent after a uh, a mass shooting is could could something have been done to prevent it and that's always the questions that are that are being asked is is why why is this this happened i know i, I was out of town uh, when it happened and uh, of course my phone started blowing up and uh, so i was getting bits and pieces of, of information on uh, what was going on and reporters were calling me right away. And I said, you know, I don't really have a comment right now because I'm trying to get information about what's happening. And I think the worst thing that you can do after an incident like this in the position that I am, that I'm in, is to get on uh, in front of a camera and start talking uh, when you really don't have all the facts. So uh, I think... Um, like most communities, uh, uh, Colorado Springs has a spirit of resolve, and there's been a lot of outpouring uh, for the families uh, and the business that was uh, uh, that was involved in this horrific shooting, and uh, and now we're uh, uh, as legislators we're we're trying to think about you know what what laws are in place and uh, what can we do further to help prevent this uh, from happening uh, in the future. Has, has, has Colorado Springs experienced anything like this before? Mass shootings? Uh, not in Colorado Springs, but you know, we had a mass shooting uh, just north of us in Boulder uh, not too long ago uh, in a uh, King Supers. And uh, so we're, we're aware of, of things that are happening, but uh, when it happened here, that it always brings back uh, mass shootings that happen not only around the country but happen close by, 
And of course, the uh, um, people are familiar with what happened in Boulder. People are familiar with what happened in the Aurora theater shooting. Uh, uh, actually, 10, 10 years ago, several years ago. The Florida, and then the, in Florida too? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the thing that, that a lot of people don't realize, and uh, uh, Senator Lex Sullivan, uh, former uh, representative, uh, I'll be serving with, uh, with him in the Senate here in the, in the coming months. Uh, he mentioned in a meeting that we had the other day that there was like seven shootings since, uh, uh, since the shooting happened in, at, the, at Club Q. And, and that's what happens, that there's focus on a big event and then other things happen. And those are kind of put, put to the side because uh, it's hard to comprehend and it's hard to, for people to process, you know, very emotional events like that in a, in a quick manner. What, what is the conversation being had in the legislature about shootings across the country? What, it, what do you guys talk about? It's, um, let me turn this off. I can see that in the background. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, first of all, the, uh, the conversation about what, what can we do to help, help the families? Uh, you know, uh, there was a lot of resources that, uh, that come together uh, to help in, in uh, those that are in, in, in crisis mode that need uh, uh, mental health counseling or just need uh, uh, some time to reflect. And then uh, a lot of other resources came into play because some, some people, they have families, they, uh, they, uh, they still have, have, have to go to work. Uh, they still have children that need daycare. Uh, so there was a lot of resources uh, uh, that came together uh, at one place uh, on the campus of uh, uh, UCCS here. And, but the conversation among legislators were, uh, could, have this, could this have been prevented? And, and now the conversations around uh, what can we do legislatively uh, to help uh, protect uh, not only the LGBT community uh, from gun violence, but our, our community at large. And what's the answer to some of those or what what solutions are being discussed around what further action can be taken? And let me you know, say here in Washington state, I know, you know, we've had some of our senators on, um, we have a senator, a couple of them who have been working on, you know, trying to pass laws for gun control. And, you know, I mean, I'm just, you know, you know me, you, you actually know me. So, you know, mm -hmm. I have a, um, you know, we've been talking about that kind of stuff for a hot minute now. Right. So mm -hmm. here we are where the, the increase, the rhetoric on and hatred, um, it's like visceral, it's out there, it's increasing, it's back, you know, Twitter's back open, you know, we are, are the community at large is under attack, but all community, BIPOC community, LGBTQ community under attack. And so elected representatives, we are putting people in seats of power to help solve these problems for us. And it doesn't feel as if they're getting solved. And so what's next? What, what do we do besides talk about potential solutions? How do we get solutions in place? What are some of the thoughts? Are we thinking broader than gun control? Um, I, you know, I'm just probing at that. What are your thoughts about that? Well, that's a very good question. And, uh, and, and we are certainly thinking uh, outside the box because, uh, like I said before, sometimes we focus on uh, the immediate crisis and uh, we we have passed a lot of uh, gun safety legislation in uh, uh, in Colorado. Uh, actually, since I've been in the legislature, I started in 2013, and we've passed several pieces. We started with uh, 
several pieces of legislation in 2013, and we've added on to that. And I think uh, now we're talking about uh, the legislation that we've passed. Uh, how is that being implemented and is that being enforced? Because, you know, we can we can write bills all day long and they can become law if they're signed by the governor. But if they're not implemented, if they're not enforced, uh, then it's nothing more than a law that's written on a piece of paper. What so sort we, of laws do you guys have in place there around this? Well, we have, uh, you know, we increase background checks. Uh, uh, most recently, a, a few years ago, uh, we put we put in place what we call uh, uh, extreme uh, risk protection order or called ERPO. And basically that's, uh, that requires an individual to surrender their firearms if uh, a family member or a, or a member of law enforcement uh, petitions the court and says that uh, we have an individual that I know uh, that we feel is a danger to themselves or it could be a danger to the community. And that has that has to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt for a, uh, a judge to order uh, that extreme risk order. So, uh, if, if that, uh, if that order is put in place, uh, then law enforcement is notified, uh, and they have the, the ability to, uh, uh, to seize that person's weapons in a manner that's safe for them. Uh, and that, that order can be, can be, uh, in place for, uh, for a year. It could be shorter. It depends on uh, on the judge. There's also resources available for uh, for that person if they need uh, mental health counseling or or there there may be some requirement for them uh, to take ang anger management classes or whatever whatever the complaint was that the judge believe uh, that that person is a risk during that. Uh, the time that that, uh, uh, that risk order is in place, that individual has an opportunity to petition the court and say, I've done these things and I feel like I'm no longer a risk uh, to myself or to the community and I would like to have my firearms back. So they have, there's due process in place and it's up to the judge to make that decision uh, if that person uh, has done the things that they need to do uh, to where they're no, uh, they're no longer a risk to themselves because, uh, we have a, uh, a lot of suicides in the country. Uh, we have a number of suicides, uh, here in El Paso County, uh, from, uh, from the youth, from LGBTQ community to our first responders, to military, it's just a lot of people dealing with a lot of things. And, uh, you know, with, when COVID happened, you know, it, uh, what it did, it put a mirror up and exposed a lot of things that uh, a lot of folks were, were hiding. Uh, and then when they were confined uh, at home and couldn't get out, then those things escalated. And I think that we're still dealing with those and we're wanting so much to come out of COVID and get back to some sense of normal that we're not taking care of the people that uh, that those problems really escalated when COVID really happened. So uh, we need we still need to uh, uh, think about. We did a lot of pieces of legislation regarding mental health. Uh, we did several uh, a, a piece of legislation to. Uh, to require people that have firearms to keep them safe, keep them locked up in their in their home, uh, because we've had incidents where kids get a hold of guns, uh, and uh, and background checks do work, and they work in this way: if uh, uh, <clears throat> if a person has has been convicted of something or there's something on their record, and they go to purchase a firearm, and that background is in place it's going to send a red flag up and and they're not going to be able to purchase a firearm if they have some things in their background that are uh, that that are going to put them at risk 
and put others at risk. So there's a, uh, and there's another, uh, uh, some other things that we're thinking about right now, a family member or law enforcement can, can do a herbal, uh, a herbal, uh, or herbal complaint. And in some states, uh, they've extended that to, to uh, mental health counselors. Uh, so it's, uh, we just have to, uh, uh, we have to continue the conversation and not just have the conversation when a uh, mass shooting happens. And that's what we, I think that we're guilty of all over the country is that we have these conversations when something happens, but we don't continue the conversation uh, in, in between the time. And I had a couple of thoughts about some things uh, today that I was processing. I'm gonna share those thoughts and then I'm gonna welcome in uh, Deontay into the conversation because he, uh, in his role as a chair of LTBTQ, I think it will be, um, I wanna hear his thoughts on it. Let me tell you a couple of thoughts I had today. First off, there was a um, an execution done. I can't remember which state. A uh, capital punishment execution today that um, I was reading about that occurred from somebody who actually did commit murder, and I, I don't remember all the details of it. I I was reading that and I saw how, you know, in this particular state, they're dealing with a person who committed murders. In that particular case, that was a black man. In the Colorado Springs shootings, uh, this was a white man, and uh, these domestic terrorists are everywhere, and the accountability for them to be held accountable for their actions, it is so difficult to have accountability uh, for these folks. Also, I read about uh, him today that his mother, something about the shooter's mother was having a meltdown or, you know, um, she's not the first mom of a white male who has participated in, um, in some shape or fashion, in the murders of other people. And this was flat out murder. And so what was going on inside of me today is, you know, we have these laws across the country where we lock black men up for smoking a joint. Um, so why can't we have laws for something what I'm just calling one and done, right? They go out and do this kind of stuff. Let's deal with them. Like they don't get second chances. Let's get them locked up and held accountable and their mamas too, who are contributing to these shootings across the country. And so I'm just wondering if, you know, if, if the gun laws are not working, then how can we start dealing with the accountability piece uh, in a much more aggressive fashion than what we've done historically? So those were just thoughts I had. Let me welcome in Deontay Damper into this conversation um, because I'd love to hear. Good evening, Mr. Damper. Good evening. I'm sorry about the technical difficulties earlier. <laughs> Great to meet you. Okay. Meet uh, Representative and Senator-elect Tony Exum here. This is Deontay, who serves on our um, NAACP King County LGBTQ chair. Um, he also hosts a show right after this one called uh, We Live in Color. Um, so, Deontay, I, did you catch some of the conversation what I was having? With uh, yes, I, I caught a lot of it. And I mean, you're, you're right on the money. And I think the representative made a great point when we were talking about policy and accountability. But I think it goes it goes so much beyond like the performative things. Right. We see them share. Oh, yes. These people gun down. Or, yes, we're help, we're going to help you celebrate pride. But all in all. We have to be more intentional of knowing what's impacting our community members that identify as LGBTQIA, right? When we look at our, and the policy changes are not just towards the hate, it's also towards what has been impacting them from jump. When we look at our homeless youth, 70% of them are Black LGBTQIA. Mm -hmm. When we look at, um, even out there in your city, Colorado, right? They went, in 2016, y'all had, what, I believe it was 16 16 um, hate crime spaces towards LGBTQIA. Now in, in, 2020, in 2021, I think it jumped up to 94. Um, so it's like, I think that we know that also what's going, going on out there in the policies in our communities um, nationally, um, people are being a lot more vocal about their hate. Um, and that is, that is the scary thing. You know, um, I know that in Seattle, uh, in, in the state, 
we did try to make sure we brought more education towards community members. Uh, Referendum 90, which was going to bring H, uh, a, uh, LGBTQIA um, education into the schools. And there was a lot of pushback in our community. And I am talking about the Black community. They mm -hmm. felt as though it's the gay agenda. Um, but there was a lot in there that talks about our safety and um, LGBTQIA affirming lessons. So then we, we, once people learn who we are, the hate, the hate subsides. That, that's, that's not something that happens in, in our community once people actually get an opportunity to know who we are. And, not, and it's not LGBTQ whatever, it's LGBTQIA plus. And there is a diaspora up here that needs the safety. Yeah, I appreciate no, that. No, I'm long winded. Sorry. I think the clarity on it, because I, I am, you know, my, I have not focused, but the show has not historically focused on LGBTQIA plus issues. Yes. Uh, but this is a learning for me also, because as I saw this unfolding, and then, um, and I happen to know uh, Senator Exum, and that this was his community, and I made a call to him to see what was happening and yeah. how things were back there. And I know that many of the electeds, in fact, I just saw a comment from one of our senators locally who is listening to the show tonight. This yeah. is an important, Senator Claire Wilson just commented, this is a, an important issue that we've got to bring some solutions um, to. And beyond, uh, you use the term performative and beyond conversations, we've got yeah. to get some action. Uh, Senator Exum, do you have a Democrat majority in the legislature there in Colorado Springs? Yes, uh, in the House, uh, uh, we'll have a, a super majority to be 46 to 19, and we've increased the uh, majority in in the Senate by two. It will be uh, 23 to 12. So you have you essentially you will have the power to make something happen by having that kind of, I mean, am I making a right the right assumption with, you know, I mean, this is politics, right? You gotta get policies in place to help um, pass laws and hold people accountable. So do you think um, for 2023 session, when do you go back in session, January also? January 9th, we start. Do you mm -hmm. believe that this is a top of the agenda for Colorado? It, it will be. Uh, and we've we've passed, uh, uh, Mr. Is it is it is it Dapper? Is it, am I pronouncing the last name right? Dapper, yes, sir. I like that Dapper. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we've passed a number of uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, legislation o over the years, and we, we've gotten uh, the pushback, like I'm sure uh, you have in in Seattle. Absolutely. Uh, and I do agree that uh, if we're going to solve these issues. Uh, or help solve them or address them, uh, we have to educate the community uh, that everybody in the community has a right for uh, to be free to make their own choices, to be free to have uh, the education that they want, to be free to open up businesses that they want, and to be free to, uh, to be who they are. Uh, and uh, we, we do have laws in place that uh, when cause somebody asked me the question uh, before uh, law enforcement uh, decided to uh, to treat this as a as a hate crime. And I told them, I said, well, it, it's not very difficult for me when you have the situation, a white male that's armed that goes into a gay club and start shooting. I said, you don't have to be a genius to, to figure out that that was intentional. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and the person is going to be held accountable. And, and I'm, I'm sure you, uh, you've read, you've read the story. Uh, uh, it, it could have been a lot worse if it hadn't been for the actions of uh, mm -hmm. some very alert people and very courageous people that were in the club because uh, this person came uh uh, loaded for bear, mm -hmm. had a, a number of magazines and uh, and and getting back to Mr. Damper's uh, uh, question about uh, the education, I, I think that's it, it's important, but we have to be careful and still have to be strategic about making policy that comes up because it's it's heightened right now, 
but we still have to be strategic about the the policies that we make uh, that they're not done uh, with the wrong spirit that they're done with the spirit of of helping everybody in our community including the lgbtq community to make sure they feel safe in their workplace to make sure they feel safe uh, when they go out make sure they still feel safe in uh in the schools that uh that they attend yeah and I, and I know that we have to be intentional, like patient in that space, right? But as we do that, right, more black trans women are getting killed every day. Yeah. And I don't see any black community leaders ever standing up here in Seattle, standing up nationally. I was a part of a, one of the biggest uh, black led organizations and I never seen them once stand up and say, hey, stop killing our trans women or hey, we're going to mm -hmm. investigate this, like how we do it, how we do with police officers towards black men. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's like the call to action is just, it's more so of the now. And it's really time to kind of just start bringing people into what that, that, that the need is. It's an urgency. And yes, there are gun, and gun violence does happen, has been happening often in gay, in queer communities, in clubs. But above all else, it's been happening in our very own neighborhoods, uh, mm -hmm. black and brown folks. <laughs> and and we have to be able to be in the space to hold people accountable for that too um mm -hmm. and policy change especially towards all of our queer community members is just really important but if i if i could representative you did say something about um earlier you were talking about the parents and one thing that stuck out to me and it was so i cried when i watched the father of the shooter speak because it was so much it was so much hate in it um, you could tell he was somewhere else, but it was more so of like, oh, well, they kind of got what they deserved. You know, we don't really like, we don't really mess with the queer community. We don't do gay people or that agenda. And it's so hurtful because as he's saying those things, we know that there are some people that are out there creating policies that feel the exact same way. We yeah. know that they could be some of our neighbors, our church folks, and we still have to deal with that. So. Let me, yeah, let, me, I, let me just help take yeah. a pause. We have to do a quick commercial break and then we're going to pick this right back up when we get back. Um, I'm just going to say hashtag free Brittany Griner right before we go to break. We'll be right back. That up the sacks, our favorite black businesses. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yo, yo, yo. PrEP is a daily pill that can significantly reduce your chances of getting HIV. And typically, it takes a trip to a physician to get it. Now, you can visit select pharmacies, get tested on the spot, and walk away with your first month of PrEP. Plus, you'll also walk away with a $50 gift card after you complete your pharmacy visit. It's easier than ever to protect yourself from HIV. To find your nearest participating pharmacy, go to doh.wa.gov slash PrEP now. In the Washington State Department of Health and Public Health, Seattle, and King County. What's going on, world? It's your boy, OG Mambo. And your guy, D Money. Join us along with Pint Size Patron and ID Yourself. Here on Fresh Juice at Rainier Avenue Radio. Every Wednesday hump day from 9 to 11 Pacific. Get exclusive interviews from your favorite artists, all the hottest music, and updates on what we got going on in the world. That's every Wednesday, 9 to 11 p.m. on Seattle's Rainier Avenue Radio. Women are not an homogenous group. We face discrimination differently depending on factors such as ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, and more. Rainier Avenue Radio is proud to amplify women's voices. They are the experts at their own lives initiating conversations within their community about challenges they face, the solutions they're working on, and the opportunities they see. Please join us this Sunday from 2 to 5 for Women's Voices on Air. We know our challenges. We are the experts of our lives. We are master multitaskers, prioritizing our family, friends, and our faith above our own needs. Our needs and voices are too often overlooked. Please join us this Sunday from 2 to 5 p.m. for Women's Voices on Air. We tell our stories in our own way. 
Are you a small business owner in Seattle who was impacted by COVID-19? The Seattle Office of Economic Development is investing $8 million to connect small businesses to operating capital. The Small Business Capital Access Program will lower the cost of Washington State small business flex fund loans by paying down 25% of the loan principal. Eligible small businesses can borrow up to $150,000 with a 4% interest rate to cover expenses like payroll, rent, utilities, and supplies. You're listening to RainierAvenueRadio.world. Check us out on social media, Facebook and Instagram, RainierAvenueRadio.world, and on Twitter at Rainier Ave Radio. You're listening to Heartbeat Radio. I'm your host, Cindy Bright. Heartbeat Radio is a conversation aimed to take the pulse of corporate America. Opportunities for people of color, we're getting lost in the shuffle of change. I'm that provocateur of change. The hearts of corporate America are addressed. Access and opportunities will be accelerated for all people. Through Heartbeat Radio, you will gain a deeper understanding of what is necessary for change. Welcome back to Heartbeat Radio and Podcast. I know my producer's looking at me, smiling at me right now because I was like, why is he playing the intro again? Uh, Welcome back. We are um, honored to have uh, Deontay Damper here in the Seattle area. He is the chair of the King County LGBTQ on the NAACP. He is the host of We Live in Color on Converge Media. Let's bring him back on. And then we also have the esteemed Senator-elect Representative Tony Exum out of Colorado Springs. And so we were just having this conversation about uh, Deontay was powerful and I didn't want to cut you off. I just had to get those commercials in. Um, okay. But I, I do want you to pick back up because I thought some of the things that you were saying, and I look, I know uh, senators and our elected officials look to us as community to help give input into what they can do going into these sessions and how they can help solve uh, some of these problems. And so do you want to pick back up where you left off when I cut you off? Yeah, yeah I, was, I was mainly talking about uh, the messaging that, that is coming out of, um, we can say the left, but at the same time, it's, it uh, there are communities where, where they don't want to have the conversation about <laughs> advocating for us as if we haven't always been here in the first place. <laughs> um, they're, they're acting as if we're, we are a pandemic of, of community members that have always just been asking for the access, the access to care, the access to community safety. And then as we, we are having conversations about gun violence, that is a, that's a universal thing that's been happening all throughout this nation. So it's like, I think that one of the things that you said, Representative, that really stuck out to me is when we talk about the wellness of community members. So mental health and, um, and pushing and pushing community members to, to, to not just get that in order, but also just pushing our safety. So we are uh, over here in the West Coast, we are all about the same thing, so. Representative Exum, can I ask you something about that? I, I know you were just about to respond to that, um, mm-hmm. but I thought one of the, what Dante just said, it's a, there's this, this whole other issue around health equity and access to mental health. And I was, I've been following a lot of these threads. I follow a lot of the uh, health companies and what people are doing. And I actually saw this post a couple of days ago that said something to the effect of, you know, like, I'm not sure why we still have to educate businesses and HR people about the importance of health equity. Um, How come we're still having this kind of a conversation? And, you know, people like me and other people look at that, like I spent 30 years in these corporations. We've been having these conversations for decades, right? Mm -hmm. How do we move past? We've got, we have mental health. We've got corporate America who has basically not changed any policies, hasn't increased from what I have discerned. I could be wrong. Somebody could check me and I stand corrected. But we haven't accommodated the increased violence against communities. We aren't helping to solve real problems for people. And so how do we deal with the mental health aspect when business doesn't support or do anything to help create access to more mental health for BIPOC people. BIPOC folks are expected to wake up, see the shooting of the day, have a cup of coffee, go to work and perform from nine to five and go home and call it good. That is not sustainable anymore in this increased rhetoric. 
what what thoughts do you have about the whole issue of mental health um, restoring, getting more access, um, more benefits for people? Yeah, I, uh, it's it's a good question, and I, and I think a, a couple of things that uh, that we're doing and that we can uh, we need to continue to do is that the mental health issue uh, we always thought about it being in a certain segment of our society, and now we're realizing that uh, mental health is not only in the home, it's in the schools, it's on, the, it's in, in the workplace, it's it's in corporate America. And we need to make sure that people have access to that. I know uh, uh, Miss Cindy knows, and, and uh, uh, Miss Dapper, I'm, I'm a retired firefighter uh, for Colorado Springs, and it was so difficult. And when I was coming up, because I was I was taught uh, to kind of push that stuff to, stuff aside. When you go out on a very emotional incident, that you maintain who you are, and after a while. Uh, in years, and I know I dealt with some uh, mental health things while I was on the job, uh, and now we're we have uh, uh, we, we've done a better job in the latter years because uh, people kept pushing the conversation is that hey, you can't put up this shield that you're a firefighter and you can shield yourself from an emotional event when you're out there uh, going on because those are stressors. That happen every time you go out on alarm. Those are stressors that stress on your on your heart and on your your mental capacity. And then uh, and now we're finding out. You know, years later we're having uh, a lot of our first responders that have mental health issues. That all of a sudden the the people were surprised about it because uh, they thought we could put up this uh, this shield and so on. I'm I'm grateful uh, that at least in in in, uh, in Colorado Springs, and I think it's happening uh, more across the state, that uh, that this stigma about uh, uh, mental health is uh, it's okay to say I'm not having a very good day and I need help. And I I wanted to say again, uh, Mr. Dapper was talking about. Uh, the shooter in Colorado Springs, his uh, his parents, you know, obviously it was a very dysfunctional family. But what I I caught in the comics, I I listened to that uh, the interview that they did with the father, and uh, I was I was just just torn mm -hmm. because he never wanted to take accountability for his son. He kept pushing it off like uh, I taught my son to to fight with his hands and not, and not with guns. And he kept going back to said, we don't do gay and we don't do gay and we don't do this and never addressed what his son, even when the reporter that was doing the interview kept pushing him to say, your son is being charged with going into a gay club and killing five people and injuring 18 others. Right. And he never wanted to take accountability for that. He kept trying to, uh, and obviously he has he has some mental uh, mental health issues himself, but you know I still looked at that. Although he was struggling with with the conversation, because sometimes you know when, when we find out our loved ones or somebody we're close to has done something so horrific, you know we're in shock. Right. And but he never wanted he he wanted to keep mentioning about. Uh, they were Mormons and they didn't do gay, but never, he never mentioned about the accountability for his son. He kept saying, I hope he didn't do that. And the well, guys were saying that your son has been identified. <laughs> I think that one of the things, if I can, Sidi, um, that, that what he is saying um, is a lot, is something that a lot of community members nationally are doing, putting religion in before, before the safety of our community members. And giving it, giving that the excuse of why I hate, because because I've been a Mormon, or because Jesus said it's not okay to be gay. So, like, I'm sad everybody's gone, but that just justifies what happens, and that that is the part of the problem. Um, and okay. that's a oh, go ahead, Cindy. And no, I was just going to add to that, Deontay, because you're right. Um, and you know, Senator Exum, I was going to say it. Is it that he won't take accountability because in this country, 
they're never held accountable. And so yeah, when you come with a group of people, you know, I don't want to put everybody in the same box because I don't like when people do that to us. Mm -hmm. But let's just be clear about who the domestic terrorists are in this country. They are the white men, they're white men. Mm -hmm. And yet they are the ones that rarely, like we're just starting to see, we're just starting to see white people be held accountable. We just are starting to see who's the woman, I just read about it, um, the Elizabeth Holmes or the Theranos fraud, the woman who committed all this fraud and thief, and, and she's been convicted, but they're going to let her, you know, make sure she gives birth first before they lock her up. That's white folks stuff. What black people don't get treated that way at all. Right. And so, it is this. Is it time for legislators? Is it time for elected people um, to focus more on accountability mm -hmm. now? Um, and, you know, this ingrained hatred to somebody because of, you know, his whole disgust in somebody didn't want his son to be gay, that all of that is just, it's taught, it's ingrained, it's perpetuated, and they're never held accountable for any of their conduct or behaviors. And his mommy and daddy should also be held accountable in this instance, as should Kyle Rittenhouse's mother, who drove him, helped him go buy the guns and takes him to the shootings, these folks must be held accountable in some way. So we've got to find laws to, to lock daddy up too, since he just doesn't understand that he's produced, you know, these monsters that these folks are raising. Yeah, and I, uh, I had mentioned before about, uh, we have a number of laws that are in place and it's, it is incumbent upon us as legislators to, uh, to make sure that those laws are not just sitting on paper, that they're being implemented, that they're being enforced uh, before we create more legislation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that we've, we've been uh, guilty of that in Colorado in the last few years, at least the last few terms that I've been in the legislature because we've had the majority. And when you have the majority, uh, sometimes you're not as strategic when you don't have the majority. And so I think we still need to be very strategic and also making sure and following through and making sure the laws that we have in place are being enforced and being implemented before we add on more legislation. Deontay, did you have more to add about, did I cut you off when you were talking about? Well, no, no, I just think, um, it's as we're having these conversations, I'm just thinking about the representative and the representatives we have in the state and nationally uh, that are Republican. I would love to hear more of how they feel about, I mean, we just seen just recently, they just, we by the skin of our teeth, they just approved uh, uh, same-sex yeah. marriage, inter mm -hmm. interracial marriage, and 36 representatives <laughs> stated that they stated that they weren't for it, right? And so, including Mitch McConnell, who's interracially married. <laughs> right. So that is that is the that is the fear that I have mm -hmm. just with community, because I think that and, and even with some of our, our dims that are in community as well and in independence, I, I want to have more conversations about inclusivity and what that looks like, because policy change is not just you say in the letters it is so much more about our safety when it comes, when it really comes down to it. Uh, and, 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 and even what other things that impact us, such as foster care and, and health and HIV in our community, we're still not, we're still, a lot of our community members are still impacted um, nationally in this space and we still aren't having that conversation. So here we are with health equity, but that's another show. But, um, but I think that we need to be having more of that conversation because as we've been able to help community members that have survived through COVID, uh, in monkeypox, our a lot of the data and um, science that y'all had for the monkeypox and for COVID um, came from a lot of the work that was done through HIV that were, was impacting primarily Black LGBTQ community members, um, and we're still going through it and still want to help, still want to help push messaging to help advocate for our community members that are impacted in that space. Do you think it's worth it, Deontay, to? Do you think it's worth having a conversation with you? I mean, you mentioned the Republicans. I mean, absolutely. 
See, so I'm cynical about it because my view is that they're not, we, we've been talking, We've been talking like they don't care. And so are we at a point, are we at a point right now where, you know, this, this was kind of my, you know, Joy and I talk about some of this on air sometimes where when we have the majority, when the Democrats have the majority, why don't we just steamroll over these folks and get things done instead of trying to bring people along? When you look at you, you know, maybe I can give a pass to the old Republican Party, but I certainly can't to the current one. You can't, they're voting against their own interests. We, Clarence Thomas, Mitch McConnell, like they, these are the these are the Republicans. And so we're never going to influence these folks to have compassion or help pass laws. They're profiting off of our murders and off of, you know, LGBTQIA. They're, they make money from gun people. They're, so, you know, I'm just, I've thrown my hands up with the Republican Party, but you can, I stand corrected if you tell me it's worth. No, I mean, but what, what, what the thing about it is, it's just like why we keep on saying, oh, well, I don't want them in the room because I know this feels that way. They feel this way. They're saying the same thing about us. And there's just yeah. such a, there's been such a bigger divide um, when it comes to the parties. I feel like I'm watching an episode of Game, Game of Thrones when I'm watching Democrats and Republicans <laughs> yeah. go back and forth. And um, that's also the scary part. We are voting people in for people to be able to call people back in, for people to be able to na help navigate um, towards something. You have something in common with a Republican and a Republican has something in common for a Democrat. We both want to help the country in some which of way, right? And Do you agree and, with that, Representative Exum? Yeah, and I, I, I agree. We, we still need to have that conversation. And I understand your frustration uh, because I get frustrated too, but I'm, I'm also mindful that if that if my frustration uh, makes me silent, then I become a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. So I yeah. think we, we still need to have that conversation. And 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 you mentioned, Mr. Dapper, about about voting. You know, I, I knocked on over about, about nine thousand doors in this last legislative session and a number of people that I talked to about voting that stated that they weren't going to vote were young black people. And it's just so frustrating because I tell them, I said, you know, midterm elections are, mo are more important than the presidential election because these are folks that are gonna impact your life directly in your state. Mm -hmm. And so we have to get people uh, engaged. Uh, I've, been, I've been fighting for, uh, for more, uh, more involvement in the in the education or election process ever since I was elected, uh, not not only in in the community but among family members, among friends, that that have this attitude that my my vote does not matter. And I told them, I said, if your vote didn't matter, why are so many people trying to take that vote away from you? Mm -hmm. So we we have to continue the conversation. We have to keep fighting, and and even keep fighting through our frustration. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I, I, I had these thoughts. I'm like, let me filter how I, how I say that. You know, I'm just, I agree about the younger people. So I am not disagreeing with you on it. And I do agree that they are trying to take that vote away. And so more important for our younger people to, to get out. I'm just not personally, I'm not convinced that we can move the mountain with this other party. And there was a day that I thought that that was possible, but I don't know, I just, today's times just seems, seems so crazy to me. So I don't know. I mean, you know, when I look at um, number 45, is it's back on the ticket. Right. I just say capital W, capital T, capital F. How does this happen? You know, this is a two-time impeached president. This is a, uh, there's so many isms, like there's so much to say. And that's, we're regurgitating that sort of stuff. And then I look at the business world, the Twitter, what's happening, like there just seems to be no way to manage it. So from my perspective, this is more of a street fight. And how do we as black people, how do we as de Democrat, like how do we swing back? Like, so that's just my radical- Well, you know, the, the GOP 
in this midterm election all across the country uh, thought that they were going to just uh, roll over Democrats like steamrolled through and even here in, uh, in the state of Colorado. And that didn't happen. And it didn't happen for a couple of reasons, in, in my estimation, is that uh, young people finally got the message that their vote does matter. And all across the country, especially uh, in Colorado, a lot more young people between the uh, ages of uh, 18 and 25 and 18 and, and 30 uh, voted. And that's why uh, uh, Republicans didn't have this uh, steamroll effect that they thought they were going to have across the country. They had some uh, because they were after in in. Uh, uh, I didn't think that I thought we were going to lose seats in the House and we actually gained seats in the House. They were after all six seats uh, in the Senate. And they really thought that they were going to get all six seats and they didn't, they didn't get in, any of them. It's because. Uh, their their strategy doesn't change. They think because they can go and tell lies and and do all these things and 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 stay stay on their message point and not honor and not appreciate voters from a uh, across a, uh, many uh, disciplines. And I think that that caught them by surprise because they thought they could they could do the same uh, tactics and the same strategy, uh, and and it didn't work. Yeah, Deontay, I'm mindful that you have to sign on to your show, so if you need to exit, I, I, I actually I actually have a little bit more time. Okay, uh, good. I just wanted to make sure <laughs> I, I honored that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and I thought you know I didn't know that about in Colorado, uh, Senator Exum. Um, I didn't know. I haven't looked at the national numbers on the 18 to 25 vote. So if that is in fact happening, that is a good sign. Um, we also saw another good sign today with the first black um, ha uh, Hakeem Jeffries being elected into uh, the minority seat. That's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big, it's a big, big deal. Yeah. And the fact that um, we as black people are starting to gain more power, which is what we need to do to in order to um, create this change and create the momentum that we need to have to change lives for all people. And I continue to say that on the show, my advocacy for black does not mean anti-white. This is about making sure that the most marginalized communities are have the needs, the policies, the things that we need to have in place to lift these communities so that everyone can prosper in this country. Absolutely. So, yeah, I, I do see we are getting on the right track. Um, what are your thoughts? We just have a couple more minutes left before we wrap the show, but, you know, what are your hopes, I guess, for, you know, we started the show about the shootings and, and all the things there. What is your hope for this next session about, um, addressing these issues? What do you want to see come out of session, not just in Colorado Springs, but to all of our legislatures? What, what would you say would be the, the top issue? Well, I, uh, my, my hope is that is that we don't lose focus on the underlying things that are happening when a mass shooting happens, the underlying things that are happening with mental health, the underlying things that are happening with all the rhetoric, all the hate rhetoric that is going on, the underlying things that are happening when people don't have a, uh, a place to take their kids, affordable housing, uh, 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 access to uh, education. Those are the things that we need to, to, to stay focused on because they have an impact on uh, the type of individuals that end up uh, committing these, these mass, these mass shootings that mm -hmm. uh, because they're, they're almost like hiding in plain sight. It's like the rhetoric is, is so uh, is so vicious. It's like uh, this this person uh, had a bomb threat last year, and there was an opportunity there uh, to to follow through and follow up on making sure. And people said, "Well, he didn't have he purchased his weapons uh, after that." I said, "Well, if we had put." Uh, uh, had an opportunity there to put an extreme risk order in place because if he didn't if he didn't demonstrate 
a risk to himself and a risk to the community. I don't know who who does in in in, in those laws. So we uh, those underlying things that happen when an uh, individual is hiding in plain sight, we need to make sure people have the courage that when they report something uh, that, hey, this person said this, and I'm concerned about that, that law enforcement and other folks have the courage to follow through on that. Well, look, I we're at the hour, and I just wanted to take a minute to thank both of you, uh, Senator Gregson. I know uh, look, this is the second time you've been on the show, so I'm grateful that you come on and talk to our communities. Uh, we're rooting you on in session this year. Uh, I know it's an hour ahead, so thank you for uh, still looking dapper, Senator, <laughs> at <laughs> nine o'clock at night. Thank you for um, being with us. And Deontay, thank you for this. Is I can't believe this is the first time you and I actually done a show together. But I thank you for doing that, uh, for coming on and having this conversation. And I'll be in touch with you soon. To our okay. audience who joined us this evening, thank you for uh, joining us for this important conversation. We're going to continue to focus on these issues. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. So have a good evening, everyone. Half that up the sacks, our favorite black businesses. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Assuming I'm rooting for everybody that's black. Yeah.